Hello and welcome to episode 100 of Fear of a Black Planet. I feel I should be marking this in some special way, but uh, I don't really have anything other than I think this particular topic that I'm talking about today, which is self-validation as an artist particularly. It's, of course, like everything I talk about, a running theme. These are things that are always kind of chewing over in my head, but this one's the the real killer. Certainly for me, and I think it's, to me, the game changer for an artist. <clears throat> and it is the thing I admire in all my heroes, whether it's James Brown, Marlon Brando, Bob Dylan, um, you name it. It's, they have that um, quality of self-validation. But at the same time, it's, they're not ignorant. They, they have, um, there's something ironic about it. There's something, they're, it's not a kind of, you see, the, I think one of the big problems about self-validation is immediately brings up things of selfishness, egoism, uh, ignorance, um, narcissism, all those things, which are why I probably talk about them quite a lot on this podcast, because the real challenge I find as an artist is to, is to validate myself. And I just thought, actually, I hadn't written it down in my notes, but I was just thinking about this again before I pressed record. And I think that the, 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 one of the problems that this... One of the things that produces this challenge is the obvious fact that, to some extent, those who are especially performing artists, perhaps not painters and people like that, actually. Painters always seem to be the type of person who doesn't want to win affection necessarily through their art or, or to win approval through their art for themselves. Uh, in, in a way, it's sort of almost the opposite. Um, whereas someone who's a performer... It's not completely true. I don't agree. I, I think it was Olivia who said when he was asked, was it Dustin Hoffman in the um, Inside the Actor's Studio interview and he talked about working with Olivia and he said, you know, why do we do it? And Olivia just looked at him across the table and said, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, as that's the voice that creates the actor, the performer. I don't think, I think that's a, I, 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 I get very frustrated with that reduction. That being said, it is almost certainly true that at some stage along a performer's career and a writer's, there has been a lack of approval, a lack of needs met in terms of approval. Now, approval is a real need. I'm doing an acting course, and one of the things that the acting teacher said last week, you know, in reference to Maslow's uh, hierarchy, is it Maslow or High Maslow? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The need for, for, for community and individuality are equally strong needs. They're equally important needs. And, the, and the certainly those are the two sort of frictional needs of, of every performing artist or writer, of that kind of artist, someone who is deliberately exposing their unique voice to the world with a, you know, on purpose and that their unique voice is part of the art in a way in a way that maybe you could argue a bit, although it's not, you know, it's, it's debatable that a painter isn't, or a, or a, or a sort of hip-hop dancer dancing in the backdrop isn't, you know, it's still artists, but it's a different, their, their individual voice is not front and centre to the piece, necessarily, although it's important, it's not front and centre. That can vary to painters, though, that's a difficult topic in itself, but worth contemplating, actually. But, so the challenge is how to deal with that fact that there's a good, there, there, to varying degrees, is an element of people-pleasing or need for approval in some way which has at some point motivated an artist. 
But it isn't the driver, and that's where I get annoyed with people saying it's narcissism, it's neediness, it's a desire to be be loved and all that. I think that's a, a, a crude reduction of what is it. When, once you become a performer, being a performer of any kind, whether it's acting, folk singing, any anything in that vein is a craft. And, and, and it's a craft that's hard won. So for it just to be the need for approval, that's not a, any any artist knows that the the desire to be loved is not going to sustain you through the hours of practice and the hours of uh, misery and rejection and uh, and heartache that it causes. And if you do have that, that you just won't carry on. And if you're in any way narcissistic, like I've said before, it's the opposite of being an artist. The real narcissists are the one who has who have talent but are too scared to try because their their fragile sense of themselves cannot bear the idea of being subject, being the object of other people's subjectivity. So, that is there, and I've noticed this in myself because I am a recovering people pleaser, 100%, I'll admit that. I don't really like admitting too much to things on this podcast because, frankly, people misuse it and people take the piss and there's that arrogant, smug, self-congratulating hipster thing going on in our generation and uh, that will kick in right away the minute you show any fragility or weakness and that's very stark in London, but maybe that's my cynical London attitude that's coming across. Probably is, but nevertheless, it's there. So... My point about this is that if you are someone who has that predisposition to people pleasing or there's some unmet need that's sort of driving you into that kind of character trait, which certainly is the truth with me, and believe me, I do not say it glibly, because it's, as again, as my acting teacher has said, it's actually a very profound need, so obviously it's, it's going to manifest itself. So that has made me think actually before i get into the meat of what i want to say that actually the more you have that that will affect your art and that's certainly the problem i've had with self validation is that if you have this sort of psychologically unmet need you there, there's no way you can really trick yourself out of that that's a healing process that's something that has to be dealt with prior to your art and will affect your ability to sustain yourself as an artist if you don't confront it on some psychological level whether it's therapy or not that's you know personal decision you don't have to go into the analysis and be a kooky you know woody allen neurotic to 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 deal with it but you 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 it has to be dealt with prior to any consideration about art actually that's what i think what i'm trying to say and that's certainly been true about myself and it's what i need to hear um actually um, that you cannot use your art to get childhood validation. You can't do it. It won't work. It will. It will actually da- not damage irrevocably because you. You. I, I don't think you're. It's ever irrevocably done, but it will make. It will damage your relationship with your art. Let's put it like that, at the very least. And I've done that. I have to say that I have done that over the last 10 years. The need for approval, the need to prove people wrong, the need in some sense for a kind of spiritual vengeance and all the people that have doubted me or put me down. or uh, And I mean put me down at times when they really shouldn't have by people who, were in, who should have known better and who were in positions to, where their duty was to do otherwise. I don't just mean people were nasty to me. I'm not. It's not snowflake stuff on Twitter or something like that. It's 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 it, failures of caregivers, and I don't mean family. I'm not pointing fingers. I actually mean more my boarding school. <laughs> it's my experience of that, but I'm sure more of that will come out. Um, that kind of. And by the way, I don't apologize for going to boarding school. I know there's some people who will be listening. Like, oh, what white tears, what white privilege. Oh, I'm so sorry for. Get over it. You're only saying that because in some sense you wish you'd gone to boarding school. I don't wish I'd gone to boarding school. It wasn't a privilege. 
it was shit. But the only I've noticed that the people who have real problems when you say you went to boarding school are the people who have kind of insecurities about their class. I don't have an insecurity about my class. I'm middle class as fuck. I'm bourgeois as fuck. That's what makes me uh, the particular kind of brand of bourgeois bohemian that I am. And I totally fucking embrace it. And one of the great things, by the way, just as a side issue to this, one of the great things about being bourgeois from the beginning is that you're not seduced by the comforts of bourgeoisness if you're an artist. You will, you will immediately start to feel from a very young age as an artist that your the comforts of your upbringing are, are, are unsatisfactory and are not feeding you. So you're not seduced by those comforts. And that's the advantage you have over the sort of aspirant types who get really moany about, um, you know, who get really moany about when, when you say you went to boarding school or something, as if you were like personally assaulted them. The great advantage of, of having had supposedly that privilege is you see it's not really that much of a privilege at all. And in actual fact, most of the people who were at boarding school I met were really fucked up in some way. That's just my opinion. Could be wrong, but that was the way I saw it. And I felt that it was deepening and doubling down on pain and loss. And and, and actually, George Monbiot, the left-wing writer in The Guardian years ago, wrote about this, and you can check it out on his website. And he, and he, I actually wrote to him afterwards if he could send me the paper that he used saying that actually people who go to boarding school, it's a form of child abuse. Psychological paper that was done, a study. And it's very interesting. Anyway, that's a side issue. But whatever your experience in that sense, right, the, the, your lack of affirmation it's not going to fulfill it so that's the number one now that now that's not to say i'm not what i'm not saying there is get over it man no i'm not saying it. i'm actually saying the opposite of that it's like actually it's a real genuine need that you can't get from your art if anything your art is just going to increase the need for it because that, because art is, again, quoting my acting teacher, your art is your is a form of connection in a way. So it, it, you need to have connection and significance within your community as an individual. These are two fundamental needs we can't do without. It's not egotism. You can't have the collective without the individual, and you can't have the individual without the collective. It goes back to Aristotle, as I've said many times before. It's that it's an ecological equilibrium between the individual and the and the society and you can go and read aristotle's politics if you don't believe me but it, it, because it's in aristotle's politics it is one of the fundamental tenets of western european liberalism that ecological interchange hegel took it one step further as i talked about in my essay on kierkegaard one step further and sort of said that they're the same thing that's when things get fucked up and crazy and that's you know one of the things that led to the problems in the 20th century without a doubt However, anyway, my point is that these are important needs and you cannot use your... Um, I've learned this the hard way, believe me. You cannot get the validation you need as a person, as psychologically, from your art. It cannot... It, what it, one of the things you might come... Because you're aesthetically driven, I'm presuming if you still... If people listen to this podcast, they're like me. If you're aesthetically driven... It, and I find this, and, and, and this is important, this is not just, uh, you know, these things are important. You still continue to chase beauty in order to heal the wounds of that unmet need, without a doubt. But what it will not do is absolutely heal you. You will not get... Now, it might be that we... I don't know the answer to this. I'm not claiming to be Mr. Psychology here. It might be that we actually just have to we, uh, accept that that unmet need is part of who we are, and it will always be, in some sense, a challenge. I think that's probably true. Or it might be that, that you go to therapy for a certain amount of years and you get over it. Those, or they might, might be somewhere in the middle, probably somewhere in the middle. But I think that actually the hardest thing is to sort of just accept it, that you, you are this person. But anyway, getting back to it, like, it's like a boxer. A boxer might have started boxing when they were a kid because they got beaten up by a bully. And so there was a, a, an experience and a trauma, an unmet need to be able to defend themselves that drove them to that. But it's not the reason they continue to be a boxer. That was how Muhammad Ali started being a boxer. Because someone stole his bike, right? And then the policeman took him to a boxing gym when he said, you know, when the, when the, 
when uh, Muhammad Ali, the kid, was saying, I, w- I want to I want to go beat him up or something like that, or, uh, you know. But it's not the reason Muhammad Ali did what he did, right? It was It was the sort of primitive, primal drive that drove him to, that, that drew him into to boxing. But he wouldn't have been able to do what he did had he not had some wider philosophical, cultural perspective on the power of his craft as a pugilist. So that's what I say to all those people that just say, oh, it's just a need, man. It just It's like, no, nobody becomes a true artist. You, you can get drawn into something but it, it cannot sustain you just to, if, if, and a lot of people think that, like, they'll try, and, this is the kind of cult of pseudo cod Freudianism that's in our culture at large, is look for the unmet need and reduce all those, all the things about him uh, to that unmet need as a child. What a load of crap. What a load of crap. And actually, fundamentally, psychologically inarticulate, because... As Maslow says, there's a hierarchy of needs. There are varying pressures on the human heart and soul. And one of them, yes, is unmet needs. One of them, yes, is the the sense of childhood security that many artists didn't get and which drove them to, to experience beauty and to be more sensitised to, to, to beauty. But it's not the sustaining factor. The sustaining factor is the meaningful sense of... Uh, vision that they have which is organic to them or intrinsic to them so i think that i i this is I, I, this is something that is very important for me to hear that's why i'm talking about it. i'm talking as i think and I, and, I, and i feel that there's a a message in this for me that I, I have yet to really fully comprehend but the upshot is That if you are doing, if you are on some psychological trip, it's going to pull, it's going to, it's going to, it's kind of like a relationship. You know, if you're trying to get mummy to love you in the context of a relationship and you're not aware that that's what's going on, you're going to put too much pressure on that relationship. And I've done that with my art. I've done that with my art. It's not to say, as I've said, that the experience of beauty cannot in some sense heal the open wounds and to and can not in some sense offer a deep lasting nourishing relief from the pain of those wounds but it isn't the final answer and you cannot make it this you cannot put so much pre- you cannot put the pressure on your art that that, that it must be the redeeming console, soul consoling power of emancipation from your pain. That's not what the art is. And if you treat it like that, you can definitely make it part of your your recovery. And you can definitely, I mean, certainly my experiences of beauty calm anxiety. That's one of the great things about going, you know, to a, a, a you know, look at a piece of art or a film or something that really touches you in some way deeply. It's very, it's it's the best anti-anxiety of, I've ever, I've ever found. So I'm not saying it cannot be something which is healing and nourishing and, and, and therefore, in some sense, an, an, an antidote to the pain, but it cannot be the, it's not the missing link and that's too much pressure. You cannot turn the art into what you didn't have. Just like you cannot turn a loved one in a relationship into the, into the, um, the thing you didn't have as a child. So that's, Number one, get that out of the way. And that's definitely something I've had to learn the hard way. And when I think about it and talk about it out loud, it's quite a liberating thing to think about. Because really I've put too much pressure on, on success. And I think that that's the key here, is that that thing quite often will manifest itself as a need to show them and blah, 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 all that stuff. Which can be, to a certain extent, that can get you in the ring, and that can be good. You know, the boxer gets in the ring because, you know, it's like, Rocky, I'm going to show them. But it isn't going to win you the fight, and it isn't going to make you a good boxer, just like it isn't going to make you a great artist. And it actually, there's a point of no return when it starts to become counterproductive. But by God, I know that to be true.
so that's number one. You cannot you cannot put a pressure for your art to be a psychological um, panacea. Is that the right word? <clears throat> And if you do that, then your definition of success will become toxic and corrupt because you will not be able to get that hit that you so desperately need that's buried in you. Without achieving a certain kind of ideal of success, which is fragile, might never happen, and purely based on everyone else having this sort of wow realization I was wrong you know it's like I want to go to all those teachers I want to have so much success that all those teachers finally feel bad about being an asshole to me god that's just like that's too much to put on your art so if if you're having problems with self-validating this is the number one thing to look at in my view <laughs> But there's a more, there are more practical concerns about self-validation as an artist. So, by the way, just on the last thing, like the answer is not to sort of lose heart and say, "Oh well, you know, it's my only drive for my art. Why did I, you know, why am I in this hovel?" No, you just realise that there's a there's a set of psychological needs that are going to need more than a trip to an art gallery or writing a page of dialogue to deal with. And if you, and, and, and the way to tell it if you have that is if you have a very social status, significance orientated idea of success, which I have had and which continue to do in some way, that is not only unhealthy after a certain point. As I say, it can be a catalyst in some way, but it cannot be the sustaining factor. That's the key point. If that is the only thing that's sustaining your art, then you're going to run dry. It can be there. Because there's nothing wrong with having ambition. There's nothing wrong with wanting status. There's nothing wrong with wanting significance. These are all basic needs in some sense. As long as they're balanced out by other needs. If, it, on the other hand, it is the sole driver, if that's becoming the thing that you... And I've definitely slipped into this, where the need to show them and the need for status and everything gets driven towards that. That's like the, the own... It's a sort of negative motivation motivational force you're going to run dry and you're going to burn out and this is what's happened to me i've burnt out because it happened i mean it's not to say i didn't I, I definitely do have a love of it for its own sake and i'm going to talk more about that but it can happen without you knowing it because that need is so desperate in you it's so powerful and so fueled by rage and anger and Fear and 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 it, because it's primal, it's 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 organic to the human condition to have that need, and if it's been abused and unmet for so long, it's gonna ha it's gonna create all sorts of fucking problems in your in distortions and corruptions of your view of what success is. So if that if that's if your idea of success is what's driving your art, and and you're only using that as a motivation, then you're way beyond the path position of self you're way beyond the challenge of self-validation i think and i needed to think about that when i was thinking about how how do you validate yourself well the answer is you cannot you cannot really do it in that in in the kind of global psychological sense so i don't know this is this is interesting because this is all just coming up for me as i speak but um, well, anyway, one of the things that triggered this is that I was I'm watching this interview with Marie Forleo, who is this kind of slightly kooky, um, American, you know, life coach type YouTuber, and you know, kind of thing that some people get very cynical about, and 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 I've become very disillusioned with that whole internet marketing stuff as i've been ranted about many times before but i but she's nice and she's also quite hot as well i have to admit but she she's she's also trustworthy and has nice guests and is interesting it's a it's a bit girly and fluffy at times i sorry just the facts um but it's a bit opera is what i'm trying to say but she has good guests and and she and she has 
I, I think I, I, something about it's genuine. So I, I, I sometimes watch her stuff, and but particularly this, she was interviewing Stephen Pressfield, who's, um, you know, he's written lots of historical fiction about ancient Greece, and he wrote the art, the War of Art. Uh, so he's he's got ideas about creativity, and they're very pragmatic and fundamental and you know no bullshit um he's not very oprah in a way although he's been on oprah actually but he's a bit more of a kind of uh hemingway tough guy writer of that generation of guys well just a little bit after hemingway but the sort of baby boomer versions of that um and anyway they were talking about all his stuff you know he talks about resistance being a fundamental part of the creative life he talks about the concept of turning pro these are all kind of fundamental things to his vision of what creativity is the muse but he also had the, they also taught there was a little segment in this interview and i'll link to it about self-validation and they mean self-validation in the very pragmatic sense of how do i know i'm not barking up the wrong tree how do i know that my stuff is good or shit and quite frankly as anyone who's ever tried to do anything ever knows you never know you can't know when you're right in the thick of it sometimes if it's shit so the challenge is how do you keep going with that crushing ambiguity or the doubt that sets in because you don't have a final answer on that <clears throat> and they talk about the need to have good people around you uh, which I thought is interesting but that's part of the frustration right because quite frankly I found it very difficult to find creative allies because a lot of people can say the right thing and can claim to be your creative ally, but they can actually be, even if it's subconscious, in competition with you or resent you for your creativity. Or you them, maybe, even. So to really, truly find creative allies who you absolutely trust is very difficult. So the challenge is, how do you, how do you and also... You know, no matter how invested someone is, they might just, it's impossible for them to see the vision of your inspiration that you have. Because for one, they can't be inside your subjectivity. But also, it's impossible to communicate because you don't know how to articulate it. It's just, a, that's the thing about inspiration, right? So, I think the, the first thing that struck me as I was on the tube today thinking about this, in terms of the pragmatic, non-sort of psychological trauma associations of self-validation, is you can never actually validate yourself. Because again, it goes back to that sort of hierarchy you need stuff. It's a fundamental need to be validated by others. The trick is the who the right others, in a sense. But As an artist, this is going to be, I think there's just an element of just acceptance of your lot. I was reading something on brainpickings.com about Virginia Woolf talking about the loneliness of being an artist and a writer particularly, but being an artist, a creative person, the solitude and the, the, the sometimes terrifying truth of, of your loneliness as an artist. It's just fundamental to what we're doing as creative people in service of the imagination, in service of human culture, that we're going to feel alone, we're going to feel unmoored, we're going to be out in the deep waters. And so you can never totally validate yourself in, in the same way, to the same satisfaction as having, a, you know, Lots of people tell you that they think your book's great or that your song's great. You're, you cannot do it for yourself entirely. There's no, there's no end point where you're going to reach that, right? That's not going to happen. So, so to have the barrier of testing cell validation up that high is just not going to work. You're not going to be able to do it. It's impossible. You cannot, you cannot give yourself what you need community and friendship and allies to do. Um, and so I think that you accept, first of all, that you can't do it. And you accept also that it's going to be a hard road in and of itself to find the right people. And I'm on that road and I haven't found the right people. And that's not a, a damnation of anyone in particular at all. I have very good friends who I desperately need and who are as supportive as they can be. But they cannot be, they cannot, people cannot support what, they, what, what, what they're not invested in, what doesn't matter to them. 
So it's impossible to ask those people. So the trick is to f is to find people in life who they don't necessarily have to be creative in themselves, and sometimes that can actually get in the way of this. Is to to find people who have glimpsed the ineffable truth in some way of y of your vision as an, of what art your art is about, and and it and that uh, it matters to them. It doesn't need to matter as much as you. They don't need to have as acute an understanding of that vision as you, even though your own vision is going to be somewhat inarticulate. Because it's phenomenal rather than analytical. But you... You have... Those are the people that you... Those are your... Those, they, they do exist because you hear stories. And Stephen Pressfield was talking about it. They do exist. They do exist. It's just it's just as hard as finding someone to... In fact, it, it might even be the same challenge. It certainly is with me. I was just actually watching Vicky Cristina Barcelona by Woody Allen on Netflix. What a fucking great film is that? I, I didn't watch it when it came out. It's, it's about 10 years old now. But I was actually in Barcelona that year. It came out just before it came out or just after it came out. Completely unrelated, but it, Barcelona does have a particular kind of... It is, in some sense, a muse as a city, and it's 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 a very interesting, fascinating city. It's impossible to summarize, but it's actually I'm right. I've written about it in a story I'm writing, and have been writing since then. Um, it is a it's a, it's it's a city that inspires, just like a, a beautiful woman inspires. It's 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 that kind of city, a bit like Rome. Actually, Rome is like that, and to some extent, Venice. Um, Paris is something like that for people, I guess. But <clears throat> anyway, one part of the story in that is that there's this kind of bohem. Eventually, the, some of the characters end up in a kind of bohemian menage a trois, and they're all artists, and they're all living in a villa in in Spain outside Barcelona, and they're fucking, and they're eating, and they're drinking wine, and they're making their art, and it's a real celebration. There's, it's a, not a cynical take on that. It's like a real celebration of sometimes in pe in human life there really are moments like that, and and it's true that history has proven there are moments like that. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood were like that. The Bloomsbury Group were like that. Greenwich Village in the late fifties and early early sixties was like that. There were the uh, the folk singing around Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie in the late forties was like that. It was communal. It was mutually validating. Everyone was validated for their individuality by a community of other artists who were all invested in each other's vision because it all mattered to each other in the same way at some point. Eventually, it, it can't last forever, obviously. It's always very fragile. It's always very fleeting and ineffable, and, and you can't control it, but it does happen is the point, right? So I need to tell myself that because I've become very cynical about that, and it, it's always been my dream to have that, to have that kind of community where you are validated as an individual while at the same time you've got the strength and support of a community or friendship and allies creatively. The sort of um, band of bohe band or troop, bohemian troop of artists and players kind of idea, right? That's always been in some sense my ideal. The idea of Bloomsbury or um, what's the house I went to? Charleston. The they create this communal space for each other as artists, and it becomes a celebration of of their creative visions. And but at the same time, it's what's in, it's a community of individuals. That's the real beauty and and, and power of of those things. And uh, so it does exist, but you cannot force that. It's difficult. It's as difficult as finding uh, s someone to marry and spend your life with. It's that difficult and it's that fragile. So you cannot bank your creativity as being dependent or conditional on it, right? And so you have to accept that. You have to accept that you can't do it for yourself and you have to accept that the reality of finding that is very difficult. It's not impossible and it's, it's, it's one of the most worthy goals we can all have as artists, but it is not going to be easy. So you can only 
my the ultimate point I'm trying to make here is is further than that. It, it, you have you cannot totally validate yourself. You can only approximately do it, and you can only find sort of strategies and rituals to do it. And those are all going to be inadequate, right? This this is not me offering some marketing solution to your problem, man. That's not what I'm doing here. That might sound like that's what I'm doing. I'm really not. I, I'm talking about this stuff because I think it's important. You can only do thing. I do think it's important to be ritualistic about your art, ritualistic about your routine. So not having a routine, you have a ritual. That's kind of what I've said before, right? So those kind of things are crucial. Things like affirmation, things like uh, feeding your creative muscle, your imagination by going on long walks and, and going to, to think to places and having experiences that are beautiful and nourishing. And just and, and, and I think ultimately what I'm driving is having the guts to just follow that and be cheesy and be silly, like I was saying last week, and be childish and 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 be unselfconscious in be pretentious. If you want to get up one day and get and 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 take the fucking Eurostar to Paris uh, and walk around in a big Panama hat with a huge garish scarf smoking a cigarello if that is the thing that you want to do and you've get you 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 have this feeling as quite often I do that that would be creatively um nourishing to do that and would be an expression of something that needs to be expressed fucking do it this is the only way this is the only option we have of uh, or the, you know this is the only way to to kind of accept that we we're not going to be able to validate ourselves completely we're not going to feel validated but we cannot. We can somehow approximate some kind of validation by honouring our creativity, by honouring who we are as creative artists. Uh, affirmations. Now, these things have got bad reputations, and sometimes quite rightly, because it's you know, it's like that scene in um, American Beauty. Annette Benning's character's driving at the end. You know, it's the final act, and she's sort of listening to this kind of Tony Robbins style business motivation tape and she's saying to herself I will not be a victim I will not be a victim that's kind of like the the worst caricature of the affirmations bullshit self-help crap right and a lot of it is crap don't get me wrong I'm just going to refill the old coffee here however I, th I found that actually Affirm writing out affirmations of some kind all right they do not give you again the big warm mummy hug that you want it's not going to make you feel less lonely it's not going to give you a uh, foolproof uh incorruptible um indefa indefatigable power it's not going to turn you into james brown or muhammad ali but what it does do is it starts to counteract the forces that are dragging you down in some way it will go into your subconscious in some way and you have to kind of trust it. And it will not be a panacea. It will not heal depression. It won't do anything. It's not a quick fix of any kind. But what it does do is it just offers the, the subconscious alternative resources to draw on other than the negative ones that are telling you your shit, right? So that's it's part of a wider sort of network of, of, of approximations to self-validation, which include rituals, going on these little trips, wearing expressive dress <laughs> i think this is a real good one you know just slight little subtle strategic validations that maybe only you recognize as being validations but if i can walk out in a waistcoat and a and a, and a, and a good tie and i can walk down piccadilly with a poppy or a lily in my medieval hand because i woke up feeling like i want to be like oscar wilde that day then by god that is a, it's a huge validation to me as an artist to do that because it absolutely do, demonstrates to my, to my subconscious, to my, to my inner artist that it's worthy and valuable and loved in some way, right? These are silly, silly sorts of things that sound absurd to the artist, to non-artists. A great example of this, I've talked about it before, is... Patty Smith's M train. Her whole life is, in a way, it seems, if if we can take from what she writes, a sort of ritual. Everything is ritualistic. It annoys some people. The way she organizes her slippers at the end of the bed, the way she makes her coffee or her mint tea, 
the the arrangement of her desk, the crucifix on the wall, the candles, the fucking type of paper she uses, her special pencils, everything becomes ritualistic. That is, a, to me, one of the most powerful things. And actually, I'm going to program that because I realise just as I speak it, how fucking powerful that one is for me. To be ritualistic. Because ritual is honouring, it's primal, it's, an, it's a way of honouring the mystery of life, right? And the mystery of our creativity is honoured when we pr- create rituals around. And to the outside world, just like going on these special little dates with ourselves or just like making affirmations, rituals are going to seem pretentious. But these things are not pretentious. They're actually crucial ingredients to to the integrity of an artistic mind. The second point that came up for me was the buck stops with you. So let's say you found your creative commune, your creative community. You feel validated as an an individual, as a unique visionary within this community of unique visionaries who are not competitive with you. It's like, I know, saying it out loud sounds ridiculous. How is that going to happen? It's like saying I'm going to marry fucking uh, Sarah Michelle Geller. You know, it's like kind of fatuous almost. But I mean, it happens. I mean, the great movements in our history have happened because of that. What was it? Who was it that used the word? Was it um, Malcolm Gladwell who used the word "senius," the genius of a scene, kind of like Greenwich Village or the Bloomsbury Group, blah, blah, blah. It happens, and it's hugely galvanizing moments in history. And, the, and the, it's a huge part of it. So it happens and it's crucial and it's essential and it's, and it's powerful. And so we shouldn't be cynical about it because it does happen as rare as it is. But let's say you've found that group. You have to remember that the buck stops with you. The, ultimately, it's not selfish or ignorant or arrogant to say, you're all wrong, I'm right. You can still be open while you still do that if that makes any sense. Because you know any great artist is is going to have second opinions but the point of those second opinions is not to give them a rubber stamp to tell them they're okay then again we're going back to the little the, the mummy needs that's a, if you if you if you want second opinions because you're not sure you're worthy as an artist that's your own that's deeper stuff than just the art that's that's stuff that needs to be dealt with as a wider thing about yourself not just as an artist but as as a human being and that that as I've talked about the the healthy creative mind is open to opinions does take other people's views into account, does understand that they're not going to be perfect, that they're not perfectionists, that they're not, you know, they're not, you know, they might have moments of genius, as I believe that we all do as artists, but it's not, it's, for one, it's nothing to do with us, really, it's, it's the muse. But also, we're not going to be perfect, we're not going to be, we're not God's gift to our art, right? That's not true. Having said that, The buck stops with you as the artist. That's your prerogative because ultimately you're going to take responsibility for the fuck ups or the failures of it. So you, so the responsibility lies with you. Ergo, the buck stops with you, right? Is kind of what I'm saying. And again, we have to make sure that we only listen to people who are absolutely invested, who have who have first, as I've said, demonstrated that they have some genuine, accurate conception of the vision that we're trying to realize the, you've recognized in their reaction to your great art that they got it in some sense right that's number one. Second that they that, that, it, that they've demonstrated that it matters. Now you have to do this for other people as well by the way this is not just a one-way street but I'm just saying you know the, the way to know it from from your perspective you have to be rigorous in this demand have they demonstrated an accurate understanding in some sense of the ineffable vision that I'm trying to manifest. And are they not only, doesn't not only matter to them, but they, 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 they have invested in it actively in your ability to realize that vision because it matters to them so much. 
Only those people deserve to be listened to. Only those people deserve to be asked for an opinion. And not all the time, frankly. And their opinion isn't final. You're final. You're the artist. You're final. And I'll talk a little bit... Yeah, no, I'll go into the third one because these kind of are interlinked. The third point I was thinking about is, that, again, going back to our ideas of success that I talked about at the beginning, you, you have to really, a large part of your idea of success, we all want, we're all ambitious, we all want some kind of status, we all want to be affirmed as individuals by our community. That's a, a fundamental need of an artistic person. However, that cannot be the dominant force. The dominant idea of success must be that it's worth doing for its own sake. It's its own reward. I've had to really train myself, it's not the right word, because it was always in me. You know, you don't do art, as I've said before. You don't continue to do it every day in some fashion if that isn't somewhere already manifesting in you. But that has to be the chief drive because it has because that's the only thing that's going to sustain you through the ups and downs. You never become impervious to the ups and downs. You don't want to get rid of the ups and downs. You don't want to get rid of your desire for for status and success in the world. But it's not the thing that sustains your creativity. It's not the engine of your creativity. That's the tricky shift that has to happen, and that's hard. That's hard. I found that hard. But it's essential because the, the only way is down. You're going to fucking drag yourself into, into all sorts of hell, as I've done, if you don't do that, right? If you don't shift the balance to success is doing your art for its own sake. It's its own reward. It sounds very idealistic, that, as well, because ultimately you're going to have to make some compromises with the world. You're going to have to have at least a part-time job. You're going to have other people in your life who don't get it. You're going to have all sorts of pressures and demands in your life that are going to take you away from your art, some of them unavoidable, some of them unavoidable. So the challenge, so the challenge there is to minimize that which is not rewarding for its own sake minimize your involvement with so that does so my point here that a good example of this is that you are going to have to market your art in some way right shitty thing to have to admit to i'm very much bill hicks in the sense of marketing it's the evil fucking thing but it's it's a necessary evil in our world that you're not going to get heard if you don't in some sense market yourself but i I struggle with this. I think it needs to be a necessary, minimized necessity of sort of, it's like doing your taxes. This is another example. But the marketing is one for artists that we need to drive home to. So you're going to have to do it on some level, whether it's going around clubs with your demo, whether it's uh, sending out a newsletter or whether it's, you know, putting posters up. Some level you're marketing. And, on, and, and, and the, the thing that drives that marketing is not the energy of this is worth it for its own sake, right? So you're going to have some of that prudential, utilitarian shit in your life, even as an, even as an artist, whether it's the part-time job or the marketing or uh, doing your taxes or you know spreadsheets, whatever the fuck it is. You're going to have it, and the trick is to accept it. But... In accepting it, and this is the key point, you minimise it. Rather than chasing your tail, you minimise I mean, I'm talking like I'm a fucking authority here. This is really lesson fucking number one for me, really, that I still need to work on. So don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm just saying, that I'm just thinking out loud here, and this is for myself as much as anyone else, really. But I think that I have some authority on this because I've been <laughs> done everything wrong, right? You know? I, I've I've made all the crimes of non-self-validation. So you're going to have to do some things that are not worth it for their own reward that are in some sense utilitarian. However, once you accept you do that, you're able to minimise how much of your life is spent on that shit around your art, how much of your art is committed to that kind of stuff. You minimise it. 
and you just and, and and that in itself will become more sustaining and it will become more fulfilling and more meaningful by nature essentially right refill of the coffee I've written down here you can't reach perfection again but this is specifically related to the idea of success you can't reach perfection in success if it is really worth thinking about whether your conception of success is perfectionist or not i and that's just not being unrealistic that's even that it, it's really damaging it's more than unrealistic it's actively poisonous to your art it will stop you even getting out of the bed in the morning it will stop you even getting to the page it will stop you sending off the poem to a magazine. I do all this shit. I do all this shit. I am a perfectionist just like everyone else, even though it might not look it <laughs> from the nature of my guitar playing. But I am actually a perfectionist just as much as I am. I'm that pathological about it just as much as any artist. The test of whether... So, because because if you're not perfectionist, the first thing is what's wrong with what's wrong with trying to do it right. The problem with perfectionism is the goalposts always shift. What's right is always something out of your grasp because it's by nature impossible to be perfect. So the test has to be something, and and it's not lowering the bar or lowering standards, but it's related to the whole concept of self validation and the buck stops with you in the sense that. We all know when a job's well done. We just know. We know the days where we go into a job, like say if you're your 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 day job, your your part time job, whatever it is. You know the days where you were just phoning it in, and the days where you you at least gave it a shot. It's not fulfilling to you, but you you get you got over yourself and you did it. And there's a certain satisfaction that comes. That's the feeling that we're going for. And this is related to Pressfield's kind of attitude, which is a kind of workaday, workmanlike view of the practicalities of art. It's an interesting combination because he emphasizes inspiration and the muse in a very classical sense. He's in, steeped in the classics, but in the, the fundamental sort of daily challenges of being an artist, there's the workaday thing. And, and what I get from that is that that feeling of a job well done is the test. And and that is always going to be something that only I can know. Can you be deluded about that? Maybe. But so what? So what? I guess the, the real worry, right, is that everybody worries that they're going to be like McGonagall, the poet from Dundee, who's so convinced, who will walk from Dundee to Aberdeen to his publisher because he's so convinced that he's a great genius and, he, and when actual fact is poetry's doggerel. We're all worried we're going to be McGonagall, right? That we're 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 deluded and that um, we're an imposter. But the truth of the matter is, depending on what other people tell us, is going to take us even further away from knowing whether we're an imposter or not, right? Because. Because whether you're an imposter or not is a question of authenticity. And actually, I would argue as well, by the way, that there's nothing wrong. That I would, I, I, there, there's, a, there's something noble in McGonagall. Would that we all had that self-delusion? Because his was a uniquely bad poetry, right? Even for bad poetry measurements. So, although was it W.N. Herbert, the Dundonian poet, who said that I've never been able to, to imagine the River Tay as anything other than silvery. <laughs> Which is right, the silvery Tay. You know, it's good poetry, that, really, because there's nothing else to say about it. And he's right, if you've ever seen the Tay in Dundee, it, there's nothing else to say about it. Well, there is, but it pretty much captures it. But you can't measure yourself against McGonagall. That's just as bad as measuring yourself against Shakespeare the other way, right? This is a problem with the perfectionist types. Well, what if I'm McGonagall? Why do you... Look, 
the chances of you being McGonagall are equally as low as the chances of you being Shakespeare. But you've got to try. It's in the doing. It's, the doing is its own reward. It makes me think of what Ruskin said about the Gothic. The Gothic artisans were not the artisans of ancient Greece. They were not perfectionists. They weren't functionaries. They were artists in themselves, and that meant that something about the Gothic is imperfect, that it's, 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 it's in a very human sense, flawed. It's not consistently beautiful in the same sense as the, the Parthenon is consistently beautiful in architecture. But in, in, in that fact is the essence of Gothic beauty, right? I take that to be the root of modern art, really. It's the reason why we can still say that Blake is a visionary, brilliant poet, even though he's not Shakespeare or W.H. Auden in terms of craft, right? So the main test, when you redefine your view of success as to do what's for its own reward, the main test of success becomes, is this a job well done? Is there a sense of satisfaction at the end of the day? Even though I might not have got where I wanted to go, even though I didn't achieve what I really wanted to achieve, even though it comes up short in some way, was, the, was there a satisfaction in the struggle in and of itself? That's the key. Those days, you know, when you gave it your best shot, you know, Pressfield talks about this, I think, in that Marie Forleo, um, you gave it your best shot. Do I want to add anything more to that? No, but the, 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 the essence of what I got from that interview with Stephen Pressfield is this. that you, you, in some sense, have to risk being McGonagall to access your genius. You have to risk. It's only going to bother you if you actually end up being McGonagall if your value system's all wrong in the, in the first place, right? That's kind of what I was getting at the, in the beginning of talking about the psychological stuff. If you're so... If, if you are so caught up with the, 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 the worry that you might be a fool and, a, and an imposter and deluded and, and, and humiliated. If you're so caught up in that, and I have been, I have been, and I am a lot of the time, but it exposes, first of all, that I, I'm trying to fulfill psychological needs through, 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 and try, rather than accepting facts. But also it shows that my view of success is, is completely distorted. Because, let's say I am McGonagall. All my poetry is just meaningless doggerel. Who would want to read it? It's, a, it's just adding to the usual pish. It's just adding to the, to the insta-poetry of the world. It's not adding anything. It's just meaningless, uh, self-indulgent. Let's say all that's true. That's only going to bother me if I'm using my creativity to get, to satisfy something non-creative, to satisfy a non-creative need. And my view of success is material, purely material. However, if I am committed as I claim to be, as we claim to be as artists, to the art, to beauty, to the idea of 
inherent in that idea of beauty is some kind of self overcoming, like the Gothic artists. They, they, they work to the limit of their abilities, however imperfect those abilities were, as flawed human beings. The point he was, Ruskin was making is that, in some sense, for the perfection of classical art, the artisan has to become a kind of meaningless machine who just regurgitated certain points and everybody was given their talents and it was all split up according to regimented ideas. It was sort of like a factory thing. Whereas the Gothic artist wasn't limited to doing one job. You know, it's not you had one job. It's much more reliant on the uniqueness of the human individual and the creative engagement with the art. Now, the result of that is less perfection, but it's more nourishing to society and culture, is, I think, what Ruskin was trying to say. So, yeah. You're only going to be worried if you're a McGonagall or a... I don't think think of you know your worst fear about being an embarrassment. You're only worried about embarrassing yourself as an artist, about being seen as a fake and pretentious. If your value system skewed, or if you're trying to get needs fulfilled that cannot be fulfilled that way, it's only going to bother you. But if you start to just love it for its own sake, and you've created rituals and affirmations in your life, and you have drummed into yourself that the buck stops with you and you've redefined your view of success as to not be conditional on external material measurements then who cares who cares and I for one would rather have more McGonagall's than repressed artists in the world because repressed artists as Hitler shows as Goebbels shows as Stalin shows, repress artists are dangerous. As, um, what's her name? That sociologist. That did the TED talk. Anyway, she, sa she said that unused creative energy is not benign. I'll just leave it with that. Okay, thanks for listening. That was episode 100. Uh, I hope I haven't gone on for too long here, but I am quite passionate about this topic. And maybe maybe I, could, I would hope that this podcast helps people to live that kind of sustainable creative life and that creates that community, that, that at least an approximation of a validating community of artists that is very difficult to have these days and trust me I know that pain it's very difficult to find your Greenwich Village it's very difficult to find your Bloomsbury group it's very difficult to find Bohemia these days and I, and I, and I, and I hope to just offer some antidote to that fact but uh, thanks for listening and I'll speak to you next week <laughs>